The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, C.S. Lewis. Chapter One is called The Picture in the Bedroom. There was a boy called Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. His parents called him Eustace Clarence, and his masters or teachers called him Scrub. I can't tell you how his friends spoke to him, for he had none. He didn't call his father and mother, father and mother, but Harold and Alberta. They were very up-to-date and advanced people. They were vegetarians, non-smokers and teetotalers and wore a special kind of underclothes. In their house, there was very little furniture and very few clothes on the beds and the windows were always open. Eustace Clarence liked animals, especially beetles. If they were dead and pinned on a card, he liked books if they were books of information and had pictures of grain elevators or fat foreign children doing exercises in model schools. Eustace Clarence disliked his coven cousins, the four Pevensies, Peter, Susan, Edmund and Lucy. But he was quite glad when he heard that Edmund and Lucy were coming to stay, for deep down inside him he liked bossing and bullying, and though he was a puny little person who couldn't have stood up even to Lucy, let alone Edmund, in a fight, he knew that there were dozens of ways to give people a bad time in your own home when they were only visitors. Edmund and Lucy did not at all want to come and stay with Uncle Harold and Auntie Alberta, but it really couldn't be helped. Father had got a job lecturing in America for 16 weeks that summer, and Mother was to go with him because she hadn't had a real holiday for 10 years. Peter was working very hard for an exam, and he was to spend the holidays being coached by old Professor Kirk, in whose house these four children had had wonderful adventures long ago in the war years. If he had still been in that house, he would have had all of them to stay, but he had somehow become poor since the old days and was living in a small cottage with only one bedroom to spare. It would have cost too much money to take the other three all to America, and Susan had gone. Grown-ups thought her the pretty one of the family, and she was no good at schoolwork, though otherwise very old for her age. And Mother said she would get far more out of the trip to America than the youngsters. Edmund and Lucy tried not to grudge Susan her luck, but it was dreadful having to spend the summer holidays at their aunt's. But it's far worse for me said Edmund, because you'll at least have your own room. I have to share a bedroom with that record stinker, Eustace. The story begins on an afternoon when Edmund and Lucy were stealing a few precious moments alone together, and of course they were talking about Narnia, which was the name of their own private and secret country. Most of us, I suppose, have a secret country, but for most of us, it's only an imaginary country. Edmund and Lucy were luckier than other people in that respect. Their secret country was real. They had already visited it twice, not in a game or a dream, but in reality. They had got there, of course, by magic, which is the only way of getting to Narnia. And a promise, or very nearly a promise, had been made them in Narnia itself, that they would some day get back. You may imagine that they talked about it a good deal when they got the chance. They were in Lucy's room, sitting on the edge of her bed and looking at a picture on the opposite wall. It was the only picture in the house that they liked. It was the only picture in the house that their aunt Alberta didn't like at all. That's why it was put away in a little back room upstairs. But she couldn't get rid of it because someone had given it as a wedding present and she didn't want to offend them. It was a picture of a ship, a ship sailing nearly straight towards you. Her prow was gilded and shaped like the head of a dragon and a wide open mouth. She had only one mast and one large square sail, which was a rich purple. The size of the ship, what you could see of them, were the gilded wings of the dragon ended. 
They were green. She had just run up to the top of one glorious blue wave and the nearer slope of that wave came down towards you with streaks and bubbles on it. She was obviously running fast before a gay wind, listing over a little on her port side. By the way, if you're going to read this story at all, and if you don't know already, you had better get it in your head that the left of a ship, when you're looking ahead, is port, and the right is starboard. All the sunlight fell on her from that side and the water on the side was full of greens and purples. On the other, it was darker blue from the shadow of the ship. The question is, said Edmund, whether it doesn't make things worse looking at a Narnian ship when you can't get there. Even looking is better than nothing, said Lucy, and she's such a very Narnian ship. Still playing your old game? said Eustace Clarence, who had been listening outside the door and now came grinning into the room. Last year, when he had been staying at the Pevensies, he had managed to hear them all talking of Narnia and he loved teasing them about it. He thought, of course, that they were making it all up and as far as he was far too stupid to make anything up himself, he didn't approve of that. You're not wanted here said Edmund curtly. I'm trying to think of a limerick, said Eustace, something like this. Some kids who played games about Narnia got gradually balmier and balmier. Well, Narnia and balmier don't rhyme very much to begin with, said Lucy. It's an assonance, said Eustace. Don't ask him what an assy thingamy me is, said Edmund. He's only longing to be asked. Say nothing and perhaps he'll go away. Most boys on meeting a reception like this would either have cleared out or flared up. Eustace did neither. He just hung about grinning and presently began talking again. Do you like that picture? he asked. For heaven's sake, don't let him get started about art and all that said Edmund hurriedly, but Lucy, who was very truthful, said, yes, I do. I like it very much. It's a rotten picture, said Eustace. You don't see it as if you step outside, said Edmund. Why, why do you like it, said Eustace to Lucy. Well, for one thing, said Lucy, I like it because the ship looks as if it's really moving. The water looks as if it's really wet and the waves look as if they were really going up and down. Of course, Eustace knew lots of answers to this, but he didn't say anything. The reason was that at that very moment, he looked at the waves and saw that they did look very much indeed as if they were going up and down. He only had once been on a ship and then only as far as the Isle of Wight, and he'd been horribly sick. The look of the waves in the picture made him feel seasick again. He turned rather green and tried another look, and then all three children were staring open-mouthed. What they were seeing had may be hard to believe when you read it in print, but it was almost as hard to believe when you saw it happening. The things in the picture were moving. It didn't look at all like a cinema either. The colours were too real and clean and out of door and for that. Down went the prow of the ship into the wave and up went a great shock of spray and then up went the wave behind her and her stern and her deck became visible for the first time and then disappeared as if the next wave came to meet her and her bows went up again that same moment an exercise book which had been lying beside Edmund on the bed flapped rose and sailed through the air to the wall behind him and Lucy felt all her hair whipping around her face as it does on a windy day as and as this was a windy day but the wind was blowing out 
of the picture toward them. And suddenly, with the wind came the noises, the swishing of the waves and the slap of the water against the ship's sides, and the creaking and the overall high, steady roar of air and water. But it was the smell, the wild, briny smell, which really convinced Lucy that she was not dreaming. Stop it! came Eustace's voice, squeaky with fright and bad temper. It's some silly trick you're, you two are playing. Stop it. I'll tell Alberta. Oh! The other two were much more accustomed to adventures, but just exactly as Eustace Clarence said, Oh! They both said, Oh! Too! The reason was that a great cold salt splash had broken right out of the frame and they were breathless from the smack of it besides being wet through. I'll smash the rotten thing cried Eustace and then several things happened at the same time. Eustace rushed toward the picture. Edmund who knew something about magic sprang after him warning him to look out and not to be a fool. Lucy grabbed at him from the other side and was dragged forward and by this time, either they had grown much smaller or the picture had grown bigger, Eustace jumped to try to pull it off the wall and found himself standing in the frame. In front of him was not glass, but real sea, the wind and the waves rushing up to the frame as they might to a rock. He lost his head and clutched at the other two who had jumped beside him. There was a second of struggling and shouting and just as they thought they had got their balance, a great blue roller surged up around them, swept them off their feet and drew them down into the sea. Eustace's despairing cry suddenly ended as the water got into his mouth. Lucy thanked her lucky stars that she had worked hard at her swimming last summer term. It's is true that she would have got on much better if she had used a slower stroke. And also that the water felt a great deal colder than it had looked while it was only a picture. Still, she kept her head and kicked off her shoes, as everyone ought to do who falls into deep water in their clothes. She even kept her mouth shut and her eyes open. They were still quite near the ship, she saw its green side towering high above them and people looking at her from the deck. Then, as one might have expected, Eustace clutched at her in a panic and down they both went. When they came up again, she saw a white figure diving off the side of the ship. Edmund was close beside her now, treading water, and had caught the arms of the howling Eustace. Then someone else, whose face was vaguely familiar, slipped an arm under her from the other side. There was a lot of shouting going on from the ship, heads crowding together above the bulwarks, ropes being thrown. Edmund and the stranger were fastening ropes around her. After that followed what seemed a very long delay, during which her face got blue and her teeth began chattering. In reality, the delay had not been very long. They were waiting till the moment when she could be got on board the ship without being dashed against its side. Even with all the best endeavours, she had a bruised knee when she'd finally stood dripping and shivering on the deck. After her, Edmund was heaved up and then the miserable Eustace. Last of all came the stranger, a golden-headed boy, some years older than herself. C -c Caspian, gasped Lucy, as soon as she had breath enough. For Caspian it was, the boy king of Narnia, whom they had helped to set on the throne during their last visit. Immediately Edmund recognised him too. All three shook hands and clapped one another on the back with great delight. But who is your friend? said Caspian almost at once, turning to Eustace with his cheerful smile. But Eustace was crying much harder than any boy of his age has a right to cry when nothing worse than a getting a wetting has happened to him and would only yell out, let me go, let me go, I don't like it. Let you go, said Caspian, but where?
Eustace rushed to the ship's side as if he expected to see the picture frame hanging above the sea and perhaps a glimpse of Lucy's bedroom. What he saw was blue waves flecked with foam and paler blue sky, both spreading without a break to the horizon. Perhaps we can hardly blame him if his heart sank. He was promptly sick. Hey, Rhinelf, said Caspian to one of the sailors, bring spiced wine for their majesties. You'll need something to warm you up after that dip. He called Edmund and Lucy their majesties because they and Peter and Susan had all be king, been kings and queens of Narnia long before his time. Narnian time flows differently from ours. If you spend a hundred years in Narnia, you would still come back to our world at the very same hour of the very same day on which you left. And then, if you went back to Narnia after, after spending a week here, you might find that a thousand Narnian years had passed, or a day, or no time at all. You never knew till you get there. Consequently, when the Pevensey children had returned to Narnia last time for their second visit, it was, for the Narnians, as if King Arthur came back to Britain, as some people say he will. And I say the sooner the better. Rhinelf returned with the spiced wine steaming in a flagon and four silver cups. It was just what one wanted, and as Lucy and Edmund sipped it, they could feel the warmth going right down to their toes. But Eustace made faces and spluttering and spat it out and was sick again and began to cry again and asked if they hadn't any plum trees vitamised nerve food. And could it be made with distilled water? And anyway, he insisted on being put ashore at the next station. This is a merry shipmate you've brought us, whispered Caspian to Edmund with a chuckle. But before he could say anything more, Eustace burst out again. Oh, oh, what on earth is that? Take it away, the horrid thing. He really had some excuse for this, for feeling a little surprised. Something very curious indeed had come out of the cabin in the poop and was slowly approaching them. You might call it, and indeed it was, a mouse. But then it was a mouse on its hind legs and stood about two feet high. A thin band of gold passed round its head under one ear and over the other. And in this was stuck a long crim crim crimson feather. As the mouse mouse's fur was very dark, almost black, the effect was bold and striking. Its left paw rested on the hilt of a sword, very neatly as long as its tail. Its balance, as paced gravely along the swaying deck, was perfect, and its manners courtly. Lucy and Edmund recognised it at once. Reepycheep, the most valiant of all the talking beasts of Narnia and the chief mouse. It had won undying glory in the second battle of Baruna. Lucy longed, as she had always done, to take Reepycheep up in her arms and cuddle him. But this, as she well knew, was a pleasure she could never have. It would have offended him deeply. Instead, she went down on one knee to talk to him. Reepycheep put forward his leg, drew back his right, bowed, kissed her hand, straightened himself, twirled his whiskers and said in his shrill piping voice, my humble duty to your majesty and to King Edmund too. Here he bowed again. Nothing except your majesty's presence was lacking to this glorious venture. Ah, oh, take it away, wailed Eustace. I hate mice and I never could bear performing animals. They're silly and vulgar and unsentimental. Am I to understand, said Reepy Cheep to Lucy after a long stare at Eustace, that this singularly discourteous person is under your majesty's protection? Because if not, 
At this moment, Lucy and Edmund both sneezed. What a fool I am to keep you all standing here in your wet things, said Caspian. Come on below and get changed. I'll give you up my cabin, of course, Lucy, but I'm afraid we have no women's clothes on board. You will have to make do with some of mine. Lead the way, Reapy Cheap, like a good fellow. To the convenience of a lady, said Reapy Cheap, even a question of honour must give way at least for the moment. And here he looked very hard at Eustace. But Caspian hustled them on, and in a few moments, Lucy found herself passing through the door into the stern cabin. She fell in love with it at once. The three square windows that looked out on the blue swirling water astern, the low cushioned benches round three sides of the table, the swinging silver lamp overhead, dwarf's work she knew at once by ex its exquisite delicacy, and the flat golden image of Aslan the lion on the forward wall above the door. All this she took in a flash for Caspian immediately opened a door on the starboard side and said, this will be your room, Lucy. I'll just get some dry things for myself. He was rummaging in one of the lockers while he spoke. And then I'll leave you to change. If you'll fling your wet things outside the door, I'll get them taken to the galley to be dried. Lucy found herself as much at home as if she had been in Caspian's cabin for weeks and the motion of the ship did not worry her for in the old days when she had been the Queen of Narnia she had done a great deal of voyaging. The cabin was very tiny but bright with painted panels or birds and beasts and crimson dragons and vines and spotlessly clean. Caspian's clothes were too big for her but she could manage. His shoes, sandals and sea boots were hopelessly big, but she did not mind going barefoot aboard ship. When she'd finished dressing, she looked out of her window at the water rushing past and took a long, deep breath. She felt quite sure they were in for a lovely time. And that's the end of the chapter.